appreciative of your faithfulness. Today we're going to be looking at an early church prayer that from the book of Acts, the church had just been through persecution from the religious leaders for preaching about Jesus. And this persecution didn't end with the first century. Towards the end of the Qing dynasty in China in 1899 to 1901, there was an uprising in northern China called the Boxer Revolution, so-called because many of the members practiced Chinese martial, martial arts. This rebellion was an anti-foreign, anti-colonial, and anti-Christian uprising. In the middle of this insurrection, the militia captured a mission station. They proceeded to block all the gates but one. And in front of that one gate, they placed a cross flat on the ground. Then word was passed to those inside that any who trampled the cross underfoot would be granted their freedom and their life. But refusing to do so, they would be shot. Terribly frightened, the first seven students trampled the cross under their feet and were allowed to go free. But the eighth student, a young girl, refused to commit the sacrilegious act, kneeling beside the cross in prayer. For strength, she arose and moved carefully around the cross and went out to face the firing squad. Strengthened by her example, every one of the remaining 92 students followed her example to the firing squad. Throughout history, there have been many who've been arrested for the proclamation of their faith. We live in a dark world where even when we do good, we'll get persecuted and punished for it. This happened to Jesus many times, even at the beginning of his ministry when he healed the man with the withered hand found in Mark 3, verses 5 and 6. Jesus had said, stretch out your hand. And then, when he stretched it out, his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him. They discussed how to destroy him. This story of persecution for preaching the, mis the message of the gospel can be found all through scripture. But the event that we're going to look at today actually starts in the third chapter of Acts. This is after the disciples had been filled with the Holy Spirit and Peter had preached his first sermon. In verse 6, we see Peter being used by God to bring healing to a lame beggar. And Peter had said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. When Peter saw how amazed the people were, he stood up and delivered his second sermon. He said, why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? These words caused the high priests and the Sadducees to be disconcerted. They had to do something about this. We read about this in chapter 4, starting at verse 1. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees were greatly disturbed because the, the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. The main problem was the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, and so the next day, Peter and John were brought before the Jewish high court. We read in verse 18 that they, had, that they had been commanded by the Sadducees to stop telling people about Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you 
or to him. As for us, we cannot stop preaching what we have seen and heard. Peter and John were being held accountable for preaching a message the leaders did not want to hear. So after further threats, they let them go. These leaders did not want to offend the people who were praising God for the things that were happening. After being released, Peter and John returned to the believers to encourage them to praise God. Our text today is from this chapter, Acts 4, starting at verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one? Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what in your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Peter knew that regardless of any conflict, the church would move forward with God. These believers did not shrink back. They chose to pray all the more fervently in the midst of a dangerous time. James 5 verse 16 in the King James Version says this about fervent prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Fervent prayer is ascribed this way, impassioned, forceful, passionate, heartfelt, powerful, and wholehearted. And with that focus on prayer, the church grew exponentially as a result. The prayer of the early church believers that is recorded in this passage is beautiful in its simplicity, but it also reflects a complete understanding of the character and purposes of God. We especially see this in the first words uttered vocally by the participants as they acknowledge the very sovereignty of God. Verse 24 tells us that in unity they raised their voices and said, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Before these believers prayed anything else, they acknowledged God as sovereign. They put God first. They recognized his greatness over all things. They are lifting up their voices to the Lord of all creation, the God of all power. They knew there was power in their prayers because they knew to whom they were praying. They remembered the God who was described in Jeremiah 32, verse 17. O Lord God, behold, you yourself have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched hand. Nothing is too difficult for you. The people were specific in their acknowledgement of his greatness. They were saying, it is you, God, who did this. You are great and you are awesome. We humbly bow only to you, our sovereign Lord. When they had used the word sovereign, they were giving tribute to his supreme rank and to his power. 303 times the word sovereign is used in scripture. Like in Psalm 71, verse 16, I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. We read in scripture that terrible things happen to those who did not acknowledge the sovereignty 
of the Almighty God, as was the case in King Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel 4, the king had called Daniel to interpret a dream he had, and Daniel interprets it by the power of the Almighty God, saying that God is going to do something very radical to you, Nebuchadnezzar, in order that you be brought to a place where you would finally acknowledge the God of Daniel as the Most High God. And then Daniel gave him some advice found in Daniel 4, verse 27. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. We know from Scripture that King did repent and acknowledge that God was sovereign. In verse 34, we read, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raising my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. In our prayers, we need to lift up the name of our sovereign Lord. And as we do, he will listen. This promise of God can be found in Jeremiah 29, verses 12 and 13. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And as we lift up our voices and acknowledge his sovereignty, we are acknowledging his authority over every part of our lives. More simply put, God is in control. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present. Going back to the prayer of the believers found in Acts 4, we read that after acknowledging that God is sovereign, Peter then leads the church to pray the words of God that are found in Scripture. We read in verse 25, sorry, You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. The word of God is powerful and quick. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is his will revealed. It is sharper Um, than anything that we could imagine. When we pray the word of God, we pray his will into our lives. Peter knew that the sovereign God he served speaks to the people through his word. And after the Jewish ruling council had released them, the two apostles joined the other church leaders in applying Psalm 2 to their situation right now. The nations continue to strive against God's rule. The people continue to try and escape God's authority. The kings assume power and the rulers scheme, all in an attempt to break free of God's sovereignty in their lives. Why does Peter quote these words at this time? Because he and the other disciples understood that what is happening to them right now has been described in God's word. From Psalm 2, they understood that they should expect the sort of opposition, and therefore they should not be troubled by it. When we pray today, we need to see our circumstances through the light of God's word. For example, when we are in conflict, we need to remember we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, found in Ephesians 6, verse 12. We can also use scripture to pray the promises of God. For instance, when we need strength, we can pray according to Ephesians 3, verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might through his Holy Spirit in the inner man. God's word will speak in our situation. And as we pray, we will experience the peace that passes all understanding, knowing that whatever comes our way has already passed 
through God's hands first, and that he will not allow even the most wicked acts of men to result in permanent damage. The early church recognized that when King Herod and Pontius Pilate were uh, what they were doing in persecution of the church only looked like they were in charge. But in reality, they were not in charge at all. Verse 28 tells us, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. By God's power and by his will, he decided how all this was going to happen before it happened And what a wonderful thought for us today as we face the changes that are happening in the world around us. God is in control, and he is speaking to us today through his word and through his spirit. He tells us this in Isaiah 48, verse 17. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. And then... He instructs us in Isaiah 30, verse 21, your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go. Meditating and praying the promises found throughout the word of God will help us to move forward in our faith, knowing that God not only hears, but that he is moving ahead of us to fulfill his will and his purpose. And as we follow the rest of this prayer in Acts 4, we see that this church, after recognizing God's sovereignty and the power of his word, sent up a petition to him to enable them to speak his word with great boldness and power. Both Peter and John recognized that the threat from the leaders was real. Hear their threats, they prayed. They had seen what the opposition had done to Jesus. They knew what the religious authorities were capable of. They knew the risks, and yet they embraced them. In this prayer, they weren't praying for safety or security or even for comfort. No, they were praying for boldness. The New Living Testament says it this way, and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. And we can see in the very next verse that they knew that the boldness would come from the almighty, powerful God to whom they were praying. For they recognized that he would continue to stretch out his hand for healings, for signs, and for wonders, to be performed in the wonderful name of Jesus. They had the expectation that God was going to do amazing things as a result of their faith and through their prayers. Why? Because this petition was in line with God's plan and glory and was not for the comfort and advancement of the disciples. But these believers also knew that they were actually asking for something that would lead to more confrontation, not less. What risks are we facing in our walk with Jesus today? Anyone here been fired for your faith? Been jailed or beaten for your faith? Neither have I. But that doesn't mean we can't pray for boldness, to invite someone to church, to engage someone in gospel conversation, to give of our time and our finances at a level that takes courage and faith. In 1956, at the young age of 30, Jim Elliott and four others were martyred for their faith while taking the gospel message to the remote Amazon region in South America. In his journals, Jim writes, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Our commitment to evangelize the lost is non-negotiable. The apostles let nothing stand in their way of witnessing to the lost. Here in Canada, 
we now have a whole generation of people in our midst who need to have Jesus in their lives. And many of these people are biblically illiterate. I was reading the Canadian Bible Engagement Study online, and it stated that just 14% of Canadians think uh, read the Bible at least once a month. 64% of Canadians think the scriptures of all major religions teach essentially the same thing. And only 18% of Canadians strongly agree that the Bible is the word of God. This study was done by the Evangelical Free, uh, Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. When we go back to our text, the early church realized that even though persecution would come, they also knew that God's word must be preached to a world that desperately needed it. So they prayed. They prayed to a sovereign God. They prayed the word of God. And they prayed for more, more boldness to move forward in spite of any conflict that might be facing them. And as a result of that prayer, is seen in verse 31, that their prayers were not just answered, they were answered in a powerful way. It was a mighty demonstration of God's way of answering prayer. The place where they assembled shook. They were given an earthquake as a unique symbol of God's pleasure. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit again. We need to continually be open to the infilling of the Spirit. He will help us and guide us. And they received the boldness they asked for. This boldness is a gift from God received through prayer. And because of their prayers, the church moved forward in faith and compassion. One of the most thrilling verses found in the book of Acts is recorded in verse 32. Now, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed were his own, but they had all things in common. Note, first of all, that the church, church became a multitude. Numbers were added daily. It started on Pentecost with at least 3,000. A bit later, the number had grown to 5,000 in addition to women. In a matter of weeks, the church went from the upper room to every home in Jerusalem. It is estimated by scholars that during the first 25 years of the Jerusalem church, it grew from 120 people to over 100,000 people. And the second thing that showed that the church was moving forward is that they were united. The last part of verse 32 said, but they had all things in common. Though these believers had come out of varying backgrounds, different nations, economic status, different Jewish sects, they were of one heart and soul. They were united in their understanding of the gospel, and in the need to share it, to reach the world for Christ. Jesus has called his disciples not to a life of leisure, but to a life of service. And the disciples then encouraged all the new believers in this early church to serve with the same dedication. While each had a different task, they all had the same calling, to fulfill the Great Commission to their generation. These early church believers did more to the spread of Christianity than any generation of followers since. And what was their secret? Prayer. If we as a church want to move forward in our relationship with God, as well as being faithful to the Great Commission, we need to follow the footsteps of the early church. Like them, we need to be devoted to ongoing, continual prayer. What might happen if we are faithful in this? 
Acts 2, 47 says, and the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. And if the prayer of a righteous man has great power, imagine the power of an entire congregation engaging in prayer. Today, in Connaught Heights Pentecostal Assembly, God wants us to keep moving forward for Jesus. And this prayer of the early church shows us just how to do that. When we pray, we need to recognize the sovereignty of God, just like Samuel in 1 Samuel 7.22. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard in our ears. And we need to claim the word of God as his promise to us. Remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's in 2 Timothy 3.16. And we need to eagerly seek his power and anointing in our lives so that we are able to speak the word of God boldly to our generation. Paul asked for this very thing when he wrote in the letter to Ephesians in chapter 619, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Like the early church, we too face opposition to our message of salvation. But like the early church, we too are under orders from God to proclaim the gospel and to make disciples. We have been given the great commission. And like the early church, we can face all of our challenges with prayer. And this church will move forward. Let's pray. Sovereign Lord, we are so thankful that you have created us and have called us to be your children. We acknowledge that it is because of your love that you sent Jesus to die for our sins and to rescue us that we might serve you. Precious Lord, you have commissioned us to go into the world and to make disciples of every nation. I ask that you give us a courage and boldness to share your truth and your gospel with all those around us. I pray that those you place in our pathway will see your great love for them and will learn to put their trust in you. And we pray that you will continue to give us the boldness we need to move forward in our faith, trusting that you are in control of every situation that we face. We thank you for your continued grace and mercy in our lives. May you be glorified in all we do. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.